Uh, boa tarde uh, a todas e a todos. Obrigado por terem vindo assistir a esta comunicação do professor Rod Benches. Uh, é uma uh, ótima oportunidade para estarem aqui e eu quando digo que é uma ótima oportunidade não é por mera cortesia. É isto tudo porque vamos ter a oportunidade de ver e ouvir as investigações uh, deste professor que é sociólogo e é simultaneamente um investigador em dispositivos óticos. Ontem ele fez um workshop, orientou um workshop no MIMO, que é o Museu da Arte de Imagem e Movimento uh, em Leiria. Para aqueles que ainda não foram, recomendo ver. Não estou aqui a fazer publicidade. É um bom para aqueles que estão interessados em imagens e como a imagem é produzida é um bom museu, é um ótimo museu para, uh, para assistirem. E os vossos colegas que frequentaram o workshop ontem tiveram a oportunidade de assistir, mexer, ver e mexer com dispositivos tóticos, ou seja, que produzem imagens desde cerca de 1830 até 1920. A comunicação que vamos assistir aqui hoje é uh, um complemento do workshop que foi orientado pelo professor Rod Benches. Uh, ele é, como vos disse, é um investigador na área dos dispositivos óticos e professor de Sociologia. É professor na Universidade de St. Francis Xavier, na Nova Escócia, no Canadá, e tem os seus ensaios relacionados com as investigações óticas uh, publicados em, em jornais como The Journal of History and Ideas, Art History, History of Photography and International Journal of Film and Media Arts. Uh, Bem-vindo, uh, Rod Benches. Welcome. Thank you very much. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, uh, let me just interrupt. Yes. Uh, the, the present, uh, a apresentação vai ser feita em inglês. Uh, se tiverem uh, dúvidas uh, no final, ou se que vai haver, no final irá haver um período de perguntas. Se por algo se sentirem pouco à vontade para falar inglês, podem fazer as perguntas em português, que depois eu traduzo. Não se sintam inibidos por causa disso. Yes, I'm, uh, no, that's for you. I'm so glad you all uh, came today. And I think that he probably told you that I'm only going to speak English and that this might be difficult for you. And I'm also going to speak about philosophy, uh, an 18th century philosophy. But I put that at the end of the presentation. So, so most of the presentation will just be, we'll be talking about things and we'll be talking about images. Um, and I will try to speak slowly. Uh, and I'll try to pause and uh, ask you questions or ask for your questions. So, um, if you're not following my logic, uh, you want to know more, please put up your hand and, uh, and I'll try to answer your questions as we go along. All right? Does that sound good? Yes? I want to see you shake your heads. Yes, okay, that's good. All right. So this image um, is of a stereo view. Uh, and this was the beginning of my investigations because uh, I was on eBay and I saw this image and I recognized right away that the two images are identical. But what's supposed to surprise me, and if you can do this, some people can cross their eyes uh, to fuse the two images. And so I did this on the computer screen. And if you try, just cross your eyes like this to bring the two images together. And what so surprised me was that it popped into 3D. And that shouldn't happen with two identical images. Because uh, there, because um, the stereoscope, and this here is a stereoscope. I'm going to be talking about an 18th century uh, optical device, which you see an example of here. This is the 19th century. This is the 18th century. In the 19th century, uh, a professor Wheatstone, who designed this uh, this device, discovered and made explicit that the image from each the left and the right eye is always slightly different. So, oops, like this, left, right, slightly different, as though, as though the, uh, the, the object were rotated. And this difference is called binocular disparity. So the disparity between the one eye and the other eye. Are you with me? Yes, OK. So, so back to the 19th century, what were they thinking? They already knew all the science was that you should use binocular disparity. Why are they using identical images? 
So this is my question. What was the logic of the maker of this object? Okay? And what I'll be doing is I'll be looking at a number of objects, not just the images, but the mediation for the image, and trying to understand uh, from the artifact what the idea was behind it. Okay? And I recognized early that the pedigree of the image we just saw is from the vue d'optique. And here we see, this is a vue d'optique here. OK, that's a vue d'optique. Um, and the vue d'optique shares an aesthetic with the image in the previous. And so there's an interesting link here then to the 18th century with this 19th century technology. Um, and uh, the mediation uh, for the 18th century, so the vue d'optique was designed for mediation with an apparatus. And there are different designs of the apparatus, but they all have a similar element. And that is either a biconvex lens. Do you understand a biconvex lens? Yes? Okay. It's, uh, if you look at the edge of the lens, it's like this, convex, convex, biconvex. You look through, okay. It's the biconvex lens um, or uh, a curved mirror. But I've, I've left the curved mirror out just to simplify for today. Okay. And, the, so, and also very interesting for me was that um, this 18th century technology of the mediation with the biconvex lens uh, appears throughout the 19th century to the end of the 19th century. So this, this, is a graphoscope. And uh, this is 1890s, probably. And here you have the biconvex lens, but you also have the dual lenses of the stereoscope. So somehow the maker here believes that the stereoscope is equivalent in some way, perhaps to the 18th century. So there's the 18th century and 19th century in the same device, in the same artifact. But this artifact I also purchased on eBay, and it came with this image. And again, the image has the same aesthetic. And I'll, I'll describe in, in particular later. But it's an aesthetic that um, uh, loves the aesthetics of the theater, but it's also an aesthetic that departs from uh, linear perspective. And I'll, I'll explain that a little later. Questions? Questions? OK. OK, so here are my questions. How does it work? Are the two understood to be different? Yes, I've already. I've already. So I, and I want to understand two things. I want to understand what people at the time thought but with my investigations of history, I find often that people give explanations that do not make sense. They're incoherent, or they, uh, they empirically are shown to be false. But people have these explanations because it fits a paradigm. Do you understand a, a theoretical paradigm? So Newtonian paradigm of physics changes at the end of the 19th century to an Einsteinian paradigm. Space is understood differently. And a whole worldview comes with a paradigm, a whole theoretical worldview. Or do you know Foucault? Michel Foucault. Who knows Michel Foucault? I'm, OK, you have to read more philosophy, <laughs> especially Foucault. So he's very important. So Michel Foucault talks about episteme. OK, and this is looks like a paradigm. So, so people's theoretical paradigms can shape their theory. And I'm interested in the mistakes they make, because that tells me about Paradigm. So they're thinking from the paradigm. They're not thinking from what they see, necessarily. Or they're, or they're filtering what they see through the paradigm. All right. So this is Molyneux, uh, 1692, who describes. And, and I also i am interested in what they saw, or what they thought they saw. So he says, I'm going to read it to you. So pieces of perspective, as of churches or long porticos, appear very natural and strong through convex lens duly applied. For these glasses, making the objects appear further off than they really are must consequently make the parts of the perspective seem really hollowed out or sunk in. The French term, it refoncé. And so what he believes is that, it's, uh, OK, yeah, I don't have a good image. I'm going to. What he believes is this, this vue d'optique 
um, it has differential depth. It's a church, it has a distant, and it has a close. And he believes that the biconvex lens separates the, the, uh, the distant altar from the columns that are close. So he thinks there's a separation that's created by the bi biconvex lens, and a space opens up. This is his theory. This is what he believes. And here is his theory. It's an optical explanation, and it fits a paradigm that is both optical, uh, it uh, refers to um, linear perspective, and it refers to uh, the paradigm of the uh, camera obscura. Okay. All right, so this is an 18th century optical explanation. Here's how it works. So when the eyes view the normal viewed optique, oops, it's the wrong one. So there's the viewed optique. When the eyes view the viewed optique, they make a calculation of the distance based on the angle of convergence of the eyes. And the distance is too close for the view that, that for the space that's purported. The space that's purported is a distant space, and the eyes say, no, the space is too close. And so it undermines the, uh, the, the spatial claims of the, of the image. Do you understand? All right. And so they think, well, we've got to create a device which uh, no longer undermines the spatial claims of the image. Uh, so, and here's how, so here's what the lens does. So the lens changes the path of light in such a way that the eyes uh, become more parallel when they view a point on, on the image. So this is the point that they're seeing, but, uh, but from the, the eyes and the brain see it as uh, far distant. And I'll, I've got a, there, the projected space is further, OK? Uh, so and the, this is the optical paradigm. And it's a mathematic, it was understood to be mathematically precise. The idea was that we saw space in a, with a mathematical precision. And this was very comforting to people because it meant the spatial uh, understanding we have is true. It's true to the world because there's a mathematical relationship between what we see and it's, uh, and, and the only word that comes to my mind is ineluctable. Does anyone know what ineluctable means? Unavoidable. It's impressed upon us. We have no choice. So, the, so nature coerces us to see the space, but this is good because we know we can be tr sure that what we see is true to the world. There's a connection between the world and the mind in that way, okay? And here's how it works, okay. So uh, the eyes converge closer, and then the mind does trigonometry. Do you remember, trig you probably remember trigonometry from earlier school. You, uh, you measure, uh, where are we? You measure angles. Uh, and here, so the information goes through the, uh, this is Descartes' illustration of the eyes, and these are the nerves that go to uh, what he thought was the brain, <laughs> the spirit of the brain, and a calculation. See, this complex calculation is made, and the end result is that the arrow is 15 centimeters from the eye, and so you know precisely, okay? So this is the optical paradigm, okay? And as I said, the optical paradigm is, um, uh, is connected to the idea of the camera obscura. And here, what I'm trying to illustrate is the idea. So here's the camera obscura. There's the pinhole of the, the camera. Here's the world. And this person's, uh, there's a projection of the world. It's a perfect inversion and a mathematically equivalent version of the external world in the internal. So we know there's a perfect correspondence between what's in our mind and what's in the world. And so we can have perfect truth, OK? Uh, and it's also, so it's related to the, the paradigm of the camera obscura, related clearly to perspective. So this is the old paradigm. And so I think some of the mistaken explanations of the 18th century and also of the 19th century are based on this paradigm. And I think that, so the, the theoretical writers use this paradigm, but I suspect that the artisans who make the objects are starting to think in a different paradigm, a new paradigm which I will call a constructivist paradigm. And what I want to do is read the artifacts and see, and I want to make a claim, an argument for you that, uh, that the maker of the artifact is thinking differently than the theorist. Do you, do you understand? Questions for me? Questions for me? OK. All right. So an a, a simple way. So this, this is a Wheatstone stereoscope here. This is the experimental apparatus that Charles Wheatstone constructed in 18, 
48, I think, 38? Let's say 38, I don't know. Um, and, uh, and it was used to demonstrate binocular disparity. But what I've done here is I have taken his images away. His images were of so his images were those those different images, the, the dis disparity images. What I've done is I've put 18th century viewed optique, which are identical. Okay. Now, if and what this so what this machine can do is uh, maybe it'll see uh, maybe I'll see it in the next slide. Oh, and I just want to say this was my primitive first attempt at making the uh, the Wheatstone stereoscope. This is the improved Wheatstone stereoscope. Okay, and if you like afterwards, you can try and see whether what I'm going to show you works for you. Okay, so um, so here's a, di a diagram from the top, uh, a plan of the Wheatstone stereoscope. So you can see, oops, uh, you can see here are the eyes. Uh, here's the direction of travel of uh, a point from the image to the eye, like this. And when the uh, when the uh, the arms are parallel, your eyes should think that the thing seen is at infinity. So if you have a prospect, a landscape, which has an infinite distance in it, your eyes will say, yes, that's an infinite distance, okay? And it should provide a more spatial, um, a more spatial uh, perception. When you pull the arms close like this, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but what it does is it brings the uh, angle of convergence of the eyes closer. And I actually have a scale here which you can read off. This would be about three inches. This would be about three inches from your nose, this one. OK? So the hypothesis, or the question, which of the two gives me a clearer sense of three-dimensionality? What do you say? This one? What does, let me put it this way, what does the 18th century theory predict? So, uh, so Molyneux, what is he going to predict? Is this going to be the, the most powerful illusion? Yes? Or is this going to be the most powerful illusion? Which one? Which? He says, yeah, he says this. He says, this will be the most powerful illusion because because the purported space of the image, uh, the eyes will read that as distant. And so there'll be great spatial distance in the image. Okay? So, so I'm using this 19th century device to, to test an 18th century theory. And you can try it yourself, but from me, and Anna will attest, yes, that when it's closer, it's much more powerful spatially. So it, con it disconfirms the, the theory. So we know there's something wrong with that, that theoretical explanation. We have a new question. And I still don't have an answer to this question. Why, with greater convergence, there's a more powerful illusion of depth? And, and you can think about that because you have young minds. And, uh, and maybe you can come up with something that I haven't yet come up with <laughs> to explain this. OK. Um, what was I going to say about this? Yes, OK. So this is a, this is a Brewster stereoscope. So, so this is a smaller version of the same idea. So, so within this stereoscope, you can take those uh, images that have uh, no binocular disparity. You can put them in the Brewster stereoscope, and you can still see um, the 3D effect. Um, so yeah, so this is, uh, this is the lenticular stereoscope I just showed you. Um, this is the Wheatstone stereoscope, which we just discussed. This is uh, free fusion, which I talked to you about at the very beginning, where you just see the image and you're able to free fuse it. Uh, question, was anyone able to do that? Anyone? One. Yes. And did it create a, a sense of depth when you free fused them? So the very first image, when you free fused it, you saw one image out of the two. Yes. Yes. Okay, strange. 
So what I see is I see two sh ghostly images on the side and I see a clear image in the center. And I mean, I may, and it may be me because it may be my perceptual apparatus is different, but I see quite an intense 3D effect when they're crossed over. Okay, so I'm not convinced that you succeeded in free fusing it. <laughs> okay, and that's the whole. That would be a whole workshop in and of itself, is to teach people how to free fuse. But anyway, but so here's here's what it looks like. So it's quite an extreme convergence, right? And and you still get a 3D effect. Here's what it looks like inside the uh, the lenticular stereoscope, which I showed you previously. And again, it's a more extreme convergence. So. So this 18th century idea cannot explain the my first question is why do I see 3D with this uh, with this, this stereo view? Okay. Um, so I have different hypotheses. So I'm starting to think what what are some different hypotheses? This is another 18th century idea, and this was another way to eliminate the. Um, the, the way in which convergence uh, undermines the, uh, the illusion of depth, and that is simply to close one eye. So then there's no longer binocularity. So closing one eye, but also to use a tube, so one eye with a tube, and what that does is it masks out the periphery. So there is no information outside the image to contradict the illusion that the image wishes to convey. Do you understand? Yes. And again, in the 18th century, they think that this is in some way obligatory. So, so it's as though the mind is being tricked by the device. Okay? So the mind no longer can see the periphery, and all it sees is the illusion. And it says, ah, the illusion must be true. Okay? So this is kind of how they think. All right. But um, there, now, when, when I talk about devices of the 18th and 19th century, there are many, many, many devices. And, and when I think about theories of how this effect works, the devices are useful because they're so different that you have to ask each hypothesis, does it explain every device? And almost none of them do. Okay? So here is one device, um, a megalithoscope. Uh, uh, there's one in MIMO that uh, Anna loves, and she thinks it's a very powerful illusion. And one of the things that it does is it, it masks out all the periphery and just shows you the image. But um, this masking does not apply in all the cases. So this is a zogroscope, and that's what it looks like if you look into a zogroscope. So there's all kinds of complexity around the image. So there's no masking there. So all kinds of diversion around that image. Okay? Uh, it doesn't work for the Wheatstone stereoscope, because you'll see, if you look at this, there's a lot of peripheral information. So the masking does not apply here. Uh, and it doesn't apply in free fusion either. And, so, and here's my representation of how free fusion looks. So that's just the card. That's what it looks to me like when I fuse. Okay? That's what it looks like. Um, and you can see the image is clear. And for me, that's a deep three-dimensional image. It really does do what uh, Molino says is, the, the, the altar of that church seems greatly distant to me, so it has a 3D effect. And then you have these ghosts. Uh, but it's complex. It's a complex surround. So it's not masking. But here's, here's what I think. Here's a hypothesis. I'll throw out this hypothesis for you. Um, what I think is that um, when we fuse one image like this and everything in the background, so here's the tripod, it's doubled. Everything in the room is doubled. The rest of the card is doubled. It's incoherent. So the brain, so the brain, th so you can see this is an incoherent uh, claims to, did I lose my, yeah, incoherent claims uh, to, to spatiality in the periphery. So what the brain does is it brackets those out. It says, I'm going to put those aside because they're incoherent, and I'm just going to focus on something that seems to me to co be coherent. And I think this might be something that happens uh, with many of these devices. Okay?
But what's interesting about um, bracketing out is it's an intentional act. We, we can see all of this and what we, we knowingly favor the illusion over the real. And this is one of the things I think happens with all of our 3D uh, experience is that we choose. We're not deceived. We choose to grant, um, we choose to, um, to be seduced by the illusion because we enjoy it, I think. All right. Now, this device. So this is, um, this is an image of uh, when the camera moves in this device. Okay. But the camera moving from here to here uh, reproduces the two eye separation. Okay. And in that motion, you can see there's a lot of distortion. Yes? From one to the other. And so here's another hypothesis. Maybe what happens with the lens devices is that the, uh, the two images are different. There's a distortion. So it invites the mind to think, maybe, maybe binocular disparity. And then maybe we should um, uh, take seriously the spatiality of this illusion. It's not true binocular disparity, but it's, but it's a suggestion to the mind, and the mind may take that suggestion and, um, uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and grant that illusion um, assent, let's say. So <clears throat> I think that could be what's happening in this case. So there's no lens here. There's no lens distortion in this, because it's just a, a straight mirror. So these are still identical to the two eyes. <clears throat> but in almost all the devices, the eyes are being invited to uh, employ binocularity, because it's very clear that you're taking two separate images and fusing them into one. Okay. And when you do that with this device, you do it in such a way that the background becomes cohere incoherent, incoherent background. So the imagination can, can grant uh, spatiality to the fused element. Now, of course, any time we look at a, a representation, we're looking at it with two eyes. So we are still fusing two retinal images. Yeah. But in this case, um, the, um, this is a binocular fusion that validates the real. It validates the periphery, because the periphery is all also coherent at that, at that angle of convergence. So anyway, these are just some speculations of mine. Any, any questions about my speculations or any, any um, criticisms? They could be incoherent. Any, any questions or thoughts or observations? Do you understand? Yes. Yes. And uh, it doesn't it have to do with the visual effect that the fish eye lens is similar or it somehow has the same explanation as the 3D, uh, 3D visual effect? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think that it relates to the, uh, what I'm going to call a hybrid projection of the viewed optique. And in a, in a brief moment, I'm going to explain it. But essentially, it's a wide-angle view, which a fisheye fish lens produces. But it's a wide-angle view sutured into a single image. So, so it's a great question. And I think it's part of, um, it's not so much part of the mediation here, but it's part of the, the, the special image which was designed with the mediation. So I think you're on to something with that. OK. Uh, so, so now what I want to do is I, I want to interrogate the objects a little bit. Uh, to see what we can learn from uh, the way that objects were designed or the aesthetics of the object. And so this is, um, this is a version of this device. 
It has many uh, uh, lenses, and it's enclosed, so it has masks. And, um, and it has a, a lid that opens to emit light. And it has um, strings at the side that raise and lower flats. Now, have any of you worked in a traditional theater? Anyone worked in a traditional theater where you have rigging and the flats raise and lower, and you have coulisses at the sides, and you have lighting effects. So you have, you have track lights above. These features all reflect the design of the theater. And, uh, and so they, their inspiration really is the theater. OK. So it's a theatrical event and a collective event um, to, to look at uh, the, um, the Bureautique and its machine. So here's a Baroque theater. And this, uh, I think, this, I think, is the inspiration for all of these devices. So this is the 18th century Baroque theater. And I think that um, uh, many of its features uh, are at play all throughout the 18th and 19th century in these miniaturized versions. Okay? Uh, and uh, it's a complex image, but uh, here's where the audience sits. Uh, here are the flats. These would be coulisses. And you can see the rigging here where they can be raised or lowered. Or they also have machinery under here that can move them apart. And, and the 18th century experience of, um, of the creation of an illusionary world came primarily from the theater. And 18th century philosophers um, uh, spent time in theaters. And, and as they're thinking about how we uh, understand the world and uh, how the world is created by the mind, I think take the theater as the, um, the exemplar. So uh, here's another example of um, a lensed viewing device. It has a lens, it has a mirror, uh, so that you see, uh, say, you know, uh, at right angles. And here you have the coulisses, like the theater and the backdrop. Here you have a Dutch version of um, the optical device. It has two, these aren't for the two eyes, these are for two viewers. Two viewers sit by, side by side. And this is important about this lens, is it's designed for both eyes to be able to see through. Okay. Um, but, uh, but note the theatricality of the front. So there's the, the grand drape in the front. Okay. And here's a, a viewed optique. Um, and it has cutouts in it, and behind the cutouts are uh, tissue paper. And uh, they're designed to be illuminated from the back. And this was an 18th century um, uh, uh, Baroque theater technique. So the coulisses in the 18th century theater also would have um, transparencies and, and, and uh, candles in the back to illuminate. So it's direct inspiration from the theater. Now here's an engraving by, uh, of, a, of a, a Baroque set by Bibiana. Here's a vue d'optique. So there's a quotation, almost a direct quotation, of the actual theater sets of the 18th century theater. Here's, um, here's a Baroque stage set. This is uh, Tortelli. Here's a vue d'optique. So one's designed to be viewed in the theater. The other's designed to be viewed in that theatrical box. <clears throat> and the aesthetics of the views uh, quote the theater often. So <clears throat> here we have the proscenium arch. It's a theoretical, uh, sorry, a theatrical element. Um, here we have the grand drape, a very theatrical element, uh, like the front curtain. Um, here we have a viewed optique with a coulis built in, okay? Another theatrical element. And here we have a viewed optique of the theater, which quotes the theater. So it's kind of like a viewing box. And, and I think of the, the theater itself as kind of like a viewing box. So this is a bit of a viewing box on a viewing box. So, this, so the theatricality is something that I think is designed into the boxes, and it's also designed into the imagery. So there's some thinking there that how the illusion is created tells us something about, or can be understood by understanding how the theater works. Now I want to talk about your question, which is the projection. Okay? And so you talk about a fisheye lens, and a fisheye lens distorts in all, uh, all four directions. 
But in the 18th century, um, they had techniques for distorting on one dimension. And this is clearly uh, a wide angle view, which distorts on the hor horizontal uh, plane. Okay? Uh, and uh, this is the device which would produce it. It's a camera obscura that rotates. And as it rotates, the artist below takes slice by slice by slice and fuses all of the elements together in a wide angle view. Um, so, uh, invented by Jonas Kepler, successive images, and it departs um, from the logic of the camera obscura as an epistemological figure. And I quote uh, Jonathan Crary here. Anyone in, uh, aware of the work of Jonathan Crary, the uh, uh, Techniques of the Observer? Must read. It's a must read book for undergraduates who are interested in the technologies of the eye in the 19th century. Jonathan Crary, Techniques of the Observer. Put it on your reading list. It's in the library. It's in the library. OK. All right. And what, what's different is that um, motion and time. So we see by moving. We're always moving. And, uh, and we don't see a slice. We actually, our minds put together a number of slices over time. And uh, George Barclay, a philosopher at the beginning of the 18th century, was beginning to become aware of this. And I'll talk a little bit about him later. Um, but the motion and time are embedded in the image. Um, and that's supposed to be a D at the end of there. The, just as the active mind sutures the perceived real. Uh, and so here's a modern version from my, um, <clears throat> my hometown. Uh, so this is a panorama of our little cathedral. And here's how it's created. So that's a modern rotating camera obscura. So you, many of you have probably done this with your cameras. You rotate, you get a panorama. And what you're doing is you're suturing uh, images from across time in a single image. And I call this, and, but the, um, the vue d'optique, I think, Im, embodies a, a wide angle view. But they, they hide the marks of it. And this is a text from 1850. And this is the first time that any theorist actually articulates what I think has been going on for over a century in representation, which is a hybrid projection between perspective. So this is a conventional perspective view, this one, conventional perspective. Here's a wide angle view. This is your fisheye now, more or less, more or less your fisheye view. Um, and. Uh, and the data is sampled across time and then stitched together. And the subjective construct, uh, if you stitch it all together, would have curves in it. And of course, in the 18th century, they think, well, this is false. And we want true representation. So what they do is they, um, they straighten all of the elements to make it appear um, as though it were rectilinear. So I say the, the messy uh, sense data are restructured according to a priori conceptions of spatial form. So we already know what a building looks like. It pre-exists in our mind. And our, and our visual impressions give us something that's curved. And what the mind does is corrects. And it imposes um, uh, a geometric form onto the, uh, to the experienced data. And now here was, here's the philosophy starts, because I, I call this the Kantian moment. Uh, Immanuel Kant, the most famous philosopher of the late 18th century. Anyone? Yes, well done. Again, that's another one should be on your reading list because Immanuel Kant, everything comes from Immanuel Kant. Hegel, Marx, phenomenology, uh, Foucault, it all comes from Kant. Uh, very brilliant. And, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about Kant later. Okay. So, so what I'm thinking is that um, the hybrid projection, theatricality, uh, and the, uh, the various mediations are an assemblage. They're an assemblage of artifacts, all of which seem to me to bear the marks of, um, uh, of a kind of uh, a new paradigm, understanding how we see and experience. And, and so I'm just going to give you some of, the, um, <clears throat> some of the versions in the 19th century. This is a polyrama panoptique. It has the viewed optique, and this one is a pierced one from the back. It has the lens. It's adjustable. It has the light. Um, 
And this is the inspiration, sorry, this is the inspiration for the stereoscope. These are all elements of the Brewster stereoscope. Here's, uh, here's an image for that polyrama panoptique, and you can see again that distorted, and in a, in a theater, because it's rather, it's got curves in it anyway, you don't have to hide it so much. The verticals are vertical, but, but that's a, that is a hybrid projection. Oh, and here's, here's the night illumination, very nice. And so then, you're, then the world outside becomes almost more real than the world in the box. So in here now are um, stereo views that incorporate the 18th century in their aesthetic. So you have the theater, you have the backlighting. Oops, OK. Anyway, whatever, that's fine. Um, in, the, in the French uh, uh, stereo views, they have a whole series of stereo views that conflate the theater and the opera with stereo views. So again, there's this thinking of these, um, these uh, technologies together. And so there's the, the dark. Even the English understand a certain theatricality. So they have the grand drape. It's a, a staged backdrop. And these are human dramas that take place on the stage. Okay. Uh, so there's an Italian non-disparity view. Okay. And here's, again, a stage where uh, the performance is happening in front of the stage. And this was very much an 18th century idea, is that you go to the theater uh, to perform, and the performers that perform on the stage, but, but actually being in the theater itself is a, is a performance, because you dress up, you're showing yourself. So it is a kind of, and the 18th century is really interested in the theatricality of the social. Um, Shakespeare talks about all the world is a stage. The whole social world is, uh, is a dr dramaturgical performance. And this is so an 18th century idea is that we create social reality through theatrical performance. And this stage is a place to do that, whether you're on the stage or whether you're in the, the audience stage. Uh, here's uh, just a world of fantasy and delight. So. So here we have the zogroscope, here we have the graphoscope, here we have the uh, Brewster stereoscope. Um, and I say this, I take this enduring complex, the optical device, hydrate projection, theoret theoretic theatricality, as material evidence as a way of thinking about the meaning and mechanism of 18th century reality effect. Questions so far? Because we're going to, I think we're going to go into philosophy soon. So. And I've kind of cheated on the philosophy because I'm just going to read stuff and, and it may be hard to follow. Question? Okay, so you said how it's very how it's really fixed, how it works with the machine. And an example one is the hypothesis. Yes, okay, good hypothesis. Thank you. Yes, please. So you want to put panoramas in, in those? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because I actually had the same thought. I think it would be it would be cool to put panoramas in yeah, this. Yeah, like if I okay. if I put two uh, panoramas, uh, yes, with movement. Yes. In this sense, yes. Can I do the same effect, or it just in the center of the photo? Yeah, no. The way that the, the optics are designed here, it will just this will be to the center of the photo. You can still you can still survey the photo, but uh, but you won't have it move across. The, the image will not move across your your line of sight. But it's a beautiful hypothesis. Uh, well, and also the idea of putting panoramas in here. I like this idea. Or I imagine like it's like not just a photo, it's like like for a video, for a, like but for a video. A, a video. Yeah, and make a movement about these those two photos for cut the. Okay, so you want to electrify these, and we could have like we can have pushing. we can have video screen. These would be video screens. Yeah. Is this like what you mean? So these would be video screens, yeah. and so then we'll have movement, mm -hmm. we'll and have movement yes, and for foot. okay, <laughs> we can move these back. Same. Yes, I like this. Okay, I have no idea, <laughs> but this is. <laughs> This, is, uh, this would be fun, I think, to play with. OK, I'm going to tell you another thing about this, um, just since we're off topic a little bit. 
This can be converted to something called a telestereoscope. So what can happen is I'll put mirror, a mirror here and a mirror here, and then turn these at 45 degrees, and put them wide like this. So that's so that you, you become an animal who has eyes that are this far apart. And if you're an animal who has eyes this far apart, what happens to space for you? And it's an extraordinary effect because space gets a certain density. And it's hard to describe. So it's as though you in the green, I don't know what your name is. You in the green. If I saw you with a telestereoscope, you would be at the same distance. But you would look, appear to the same distance, but somehow there would be more space. There would be more density of space between us. It's the strangest thing. But anyway, that would be another thing, fun thing to play with, I think, for artists. Yeah, because many of you are artists, and so, so they could think creatively about different ways to do those things. Yeah, I like that. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, so, um, so back to theories and back to paradigms. So, so the camera obscura paradigm, as I said, it promised an objective world knowable through passive instruments. So the mind is passive. The world is stamps upon the mind through the retina a perfect copy of the world. And so we know the world. We can, we can trust that we know the world perfectly. Now, um, Barclay, Hume, um, the other Did I lose? OK, there we go. Uh, who are captured by this idea. So they, they, they rejected the, the, um, the old scholastics who felt that we could know knowledge internally. They said, we only know knowledge through the external world. That was the empiricists, OK? And they have the camera obscura paradigm, but they get captured because they reduce knowledge to this. So this is the, this is the camera obscura screen, but it's also the screen in the eye. And so this is like the interior of the mind here. Here's the real world. And they have some, some have some faith that there's a, there's a mathematical connection between the two. But they start chipping away at this. Barclay, in particular, has a, a devastating critique. And here's Hume thinking about it. And what I like about his thinking is you can see his metaphor is the theater. So the mind is a kind of theater where the sensations come and go like painted stage flats, moving, moved by hidden spring, strings. Okay? So that's Hume thinking about the mind as a theater. And the retinal images flitting by are like stage flats. But the external world and even the conceiving mind, for them become difficult to deduce, because they want to deduce everything certainly. And they want to deduce from all we have. They say all we have is the sense data that our, our retinal image gives us. Can we deduce a world? Can we even deduce our own selves? And they, they find this very, very difficult. So they become these fictions, chimerical constructs that cannot be deduced from the entrances and exits of fleeting sensations. So, so David Hume, writing in 1757, again writes uh, with the same metaphor uh, of the theater. He says, uh, we're placed in this world as in a great theater where the true springs and causes of every event are entirely conceived. So these would be the springs and causes. Here we are out here. All we see is these illusions. Ever the skeptic, he warned that the comparison with the theater must not mislead us. They are only su successive perceptions that constitute the mind. Again, so he's captured in that empiricist dilemma is that all he can be sure of are these. He can't be sure of this. He can't be sure of the background mechanism. He can't be sure of the, the mechanisms. He can't be sure of the theater. All he's given is this. And logic is not sufficient for them to reconstruct the world. So, sorry. So, uh, where are we? So uh, there are successive perceptions only that constitute the mind, nor who the most distant notion of the place where these scenes are represented or of the materials of which it is composed. Barclay, one of my favorite philosophers, writing in 1709, he was the one who started to destroy the, um, the optical paradigm. And if I were to do this to a philosopher crowd, I would have to do this more rigorously, and we would read a little bit of uh, Barclay, but um, he made a devastating argument that uh, it's impossible actually to deduce spatiality from what we're given on the retinal image. And he was also aware that, um, 
that uh, we construct space. He had this idea that we construct space pr partly through tactile sensation, it's not just visual. So I know the space from here to there because I've experienced walking these steps. And I can correlate in my mind what the image of its distance or its size looks like with the uh, proprioceptual uh, sensations of motion. And, and as, as a history of a human being moving in the world and, and not bumping into things and being able to grab things and find things, we put together tactile and visual uh, to construct our sense of space. We never get space at the moment. Space is dependent, our, our capacity to produce space is dependent on our whole history of exploring the world, okay? Both physically, uh, tac tactilely, visually, even auditorily. But also for Berkeley, and the reason that other philosophers at the time hated Berkeley was because he thought there's no necessity to the spaces we construct. So we construct these spaces, but we cobble them together, and there isn't any geometric necessity. There's no mathematical necessity. And Berkeley didn't care because he thought God took care of everything. So he didn't need, he didn't need the world to tell him about truth because God had already told him. He, was a, he became a bishop. So he could be very critical of the empiricist because he didn't have so much... Uh, at stake. All right, so, uh, so here we go. Um, space is not represented uh, to us as in paintings. It's a construct of the mind. Right, right, right. Okay, I said all that. And here's again the great philosopher of the time, Immanuel Kant. And Immanuel Kant liked the empiricists uh, but he was troubled by Berkeley's skepticism. He wanted certainty. And he believed that he could, through something that he called a transcendental deduction, deduce necessary forms of space and time that the mind imposes upon those uh, sensations that we have. So instead of the, uh, the categories, so I have a category of space that makes sense of this room for me, and it's geometrical, and it's uh, box-like, and it pre-exists in my mind. And I take the, the complex, immediate sensations, and I impose a mental construct, and it pops into space. So I'm creating space through mental constructs. But Kant wanted to argue that those mental constructs are n necessary. And by necessary, he means logically necessary. Okay? So he, he has a theory that the mind combines the immediate perceptions with the categories of space and time in a way that's necessary. So he preserves the idea that we can have absolutely true knowledge of the world. So that's the Kantian, um, uh, the Kantian solution. But it's a world-producing solution still. And, he, and the thing about when you read Kant, he's difficult to understand because if you read him about, and you're thinking that he's talking about me, the empirical subject, who have in my brain um, this capacity to, to construct this world. That's only half of what he's saying. The other half is a notion that comes from really uh, theological thinking. So Berkeley thought it was God who imposed the structures on the world. But for Kant, Kant, um, Kant uh, um, what's the word? Um, Kant brackets out God, but he has this idea that there is somehow this uh, this spirit, this mind that is a collective mind, it's something larger than the individual. It becomes in Hegel what he, Hegel calls the world spirit. And for Marx, it becomes the collectivities of classes, okay? There's something, there's something about this idea of a collective uh, category, uh, a ca collective entity which creates these categories. Um, Kant believes that he can deduce it with certainty and logic. Um, through a transcendental deduction. Um, and he's, he's wrong, but this is what he tries to do anyway. But this is the new paradigm. So this is the alternative paradigm that I think, um, that I think is embedded in these artifacts that I've been showing you. So I think they're departing from the prevailing theory, and this second paradigm is a, is a critical paradigm. It's a, sub, a subordinate paradigm. But I think the artisans are thinking along the same paradigmatic lines as the, uh, as the critical philosophers. So this is my argument. 
artisans built into their optical devices, not according to classical optics, but according to, again, I'm sorry, there's something wrong with my computer, according to the constructivist paradigm of vision theatrically conceived. So, I think, yeah, that's all. That's, that's interesting for another question. All right, so that's, that's all I have to say. Uh, I, I uh, have time now for questions. Yes? In your research, did you went to the, a doctor or a medical university, something like that, to ask them if their science or medicine can explain why our brain does that, why it corrects the curved image in a way that makes a perception of death when you look at the converged images, why we see space when there is not space. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have paid attention to the, um, uh, to the brain science of this. And my understanding at this point is they still don't have an explanation. They have a word. They say stereopsis. And it's a very scientific sounding word. But it's just a word that describes it. It's not an explanation. So they say, this is stereopsis. Stereopsis does it. What is stereopsis? I don't know. So actually, the, some, and, and the most, one of the most recent texts, they basically admit, we don't yet understand how the brain does that. Um, and, and I've seen, but one of the things is they are looking for is they're looking for almost like a mechanical explanation. So it's a reductivist explanation. So it's like the apparatus of the mind, again, is like a machine which is driven by nature. And see, my explanation is more an imaginative explanation. It's, it's, more, it's more what you are often interested in is, is, is the play of the imagination. We, I think we, we love space. We, we sometimes see space where it isn't there. A good example, a little later I have here, do you all know the Necker cube? The Necker cube? Um, what did I do? Oh, there it is. Okay. Ah, no, it's not here. Damn. No, sorry. Ah, the Necker cube. It's, um, I, I almost, I have to show you. What it is, is it's a, it's a, it's a cube structure which, um, you can turn inside out at will. You know this one? You can turn it one way, you can turn it the other way. So, the, so you can just choose. Am I going to have it this way, or am I going to have it inside out, or the other? And this is the spatial imagination at, completely at will, saying, I want space this way. No, maybe I'll have space this way. Okay, so I think that there's something, there's something more intentional and, uh, and imaginative, really, about how we, how we create space, even with binocular disparity. But I will say the, um, the scientists also have tested this, and they say, yes, it works. So there's scientific evidence that this does work. Okay? So you can be assured that this is not just an illusion and that I'm fooling you here. The scientists have already said that this works. Okay? Okay. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, so you mentioned two ways of perceiving 3D imagery, or our notion of perceiving 3D space. So one of them was to, uh, we feel that uh, three dimensions exist because we have experience. So when you walk through stairs, yes. um, I experience this space. So yes. uh, I'm aware of 3D space because I have experience. But the world itself has been uh, processed with a different uh, explanation. So I'm not taking this one as the one you call the most. But um, you said that 3D was also we want to see 3D because we want to believe in it. Yes. So this is rather a complex idea because uh, do you choose to believe or are you aware that you have experienced it? So because this is all very strange because we are turning to illusions in order to explain reality. So it's, it's a, a conflict. Yeah, I like that question. Um, I, I don't think they're that uh, contradictory, but um, I think maybe maybe throughout our lives we're, we're making spatial skills. And Barclay, I think, understands it in terms of skills. Um, and, uh, and when we have good spatial skills, we do experience space as though it were ineluctable, as though, as though we had no choice. And he would say that's a, a long series of intentional acts in some way that are bound together in this, this uh, experiential um, sense of, of space. 
but I think in addition to that, and I think there are two things maybe happening, because there, there obviously is a parallel between how we actually perceive real space, let's call it real space, and you're right, there's an illusionary element in that. I believe that this is right. But then how we, we read illusions, so how we read artifacts that purport spaces. And I think when we read artifacts that purport spaces, here we always know that it's an illusion, but we assent to the illusion. We say, yes, we agree. Okay, so that's the intentionality. That's the, um, that's the, uh, uh, the, the willingness to imagine space. Uh, but here's another thing. I mean, I think that if you've ever experienced the real in difficult conditions, so you're driving late at night and there's a lot of rain and it's hard to interpret, it's hard to interpret where curves are going, you're always using the imagination. And I feel that often like driving late at night or sometimes in the woods at night where it's hard to interpret things. You're trying out hypotheses. And I don't know if you've ever been in a driving situation where for a minute you're trying out hypotheses and then also you catch yourself, no, 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 I, that doesn't turn that way, it turns the other way. So, so you're using the spatial imagination there. You're throwing out, and you actually perceive that's the space that I'm going to drive to, and then as it, if it becomes a little clearer, then you say, no, I have a different spatial hypothesis, and I'm going to turn the wheel, you see? So there's an interplay, I think, between those. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess. Because um, also, I think the imagination only, only gives you the advantage of creating reality. It also has some constraints with it. So, for example, the, Talk about plenty about the, the theater situation. So, yes. Uh, you get immersed into that world and you, you believe in it. Yes. Years. Of course, there are several layers. Yeah. In theater construction. But um, it's only because of your constraints to a point of view, I guess, because there are similar objects that kind of give you a sense of what space is. If yes. you have too much of space, you don't know what space is. Like, for example, okay, yeah, space, okay. but I, I mean, uh, outer space. Yes. Uh, well, they look upon stars and upon planets. Yes. And, all, and it all seems flat because there's, enough, there's not enough constraints. Yeah, that's a beautiful idea. It's an 18th century idea. Well, no, it's a 17th century idea. Um, uh, because uh, Newton thinks about this. Uh, because Newton wants to imagine absolute space with nothing in it. And Berkeley comes along and says, there are no constraints in that space. How could you have an absolute space with nothing in it? There's no reference whatsoever. So Berkeley thinks you would actually have to have some kind of container to absolute space. It would be like a mind. And Berkeley says, well, it's the mind of God that's the container of space. Uh, and then later think is saying, no, it's not the mind of God, it's the human mind that's the container of space. But that's, yeah, that's a beautiful idea. That, but so you, there's also, you have to have constraints. But I think that in the, um, in the real context, let's say you're driving, in the, uh, the context of exhibition, you're being invited, you have to also have resources. You have to have suggestions. So, so you have a spatial imagination. It doesn't work in abstraction. It doesn't work in a vacuum. It has suggestions made, okay? And there could be different suggestions. Maybe linear perspective. That's a nice suggestion that you can take in your, your spatial imagination. Or maybe you have coulisses that are at different depths. And so, so these are suggestions that, uh, that encourage your imagination. Does that make sense? So the, but there's two ideas, I think. But the first idea, I think, is the prettiest idea. <laughs> that there's no, there's, you have to have constraint in order to have space. Other questions? Our eyes are in this position, and in this way, we we know what, uh, at, at what distance are the objects for, from us. But I was thinking, for example, goats, they know reality, <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, so they they have an imagination, like how they... <laughs> what is a goat? Is it a goat that you're talking about? Yes, and then, it's like animals. Yeah. They, they have a different structure of us. They have different structure yeah, of eyes. Yes, yeah. but they can still uh, know what the, the world is. Yes, they do. They yeah. have an, a perspective, ways to, to look. Like if, yes. If the, you put this object in front of a goat, they, 
they, they, she will not understand because she doesn't know what that object is. Yeah, but our problem is that she is seeing yeah. the role at the same time as her. Yes. Yes, and I think this is a good thing to think about. Um, and in a sense, we're putting it in another apparatus, the apparatus of another animal, and maybe another rationality. And so did the, could the principles that I'm articulating work for another animal? It's a great question. Um, and um, the difference between us and the goat, our, our problem is that we always want to reflect. We're reflexive. So we don't just see, but we want to see seeing. And this is what this is about, really. It's about Wheatstone wanting to see how we see. He wants to look at the retinal image, and he wants to take it apart and see how it all happens. <clears throat> and also, we want, to, we want to use those technologies. We take vision apart, and when we take vision apart, we discover new things. And we want to use those technologies to create illusion. Um, <clears throat> we, want to, we want to artificially reconstruct um, space for ourselves. Uh, and animals don't do that. <clears throat> so animals don't get into many of the predicaments that we get into. But, but animals do see, and animals do navigate. And I think that a Barclayan explanation of how animals see and navigate is close, but it's, um, it would be like <clears throat> a, lot of, uh, a lot of people say it would be kind of an evolutionary Kantianism. So a lot of people take Kant. So Kant, Kant is writing before Darwin, <clears throat> okay? And Kant is saying that... Um, that the mind is a purely uh, transparent and rational organ. That's how we imagine, humans imagine their minds, okay? And he says uh, the transcendental deduction tells us how it works logically and, and perfectly. Uh, and then others come along and they say, but what if, what if those categories that we impose upon the world are not transcendental deductions? Maybe they are the, the product and not of the experience of our lifetime, but of the experience of many generations of lives, or thousands of lives, that have been formed in relation so that they fit the world through an evolutionary process of selection. So that's, uh, that's ev an evolutionary Kantianism. So an evolutionary Kantianism would apply, I think, well to uh, a goat. Okay? So she doesn't have experience. Her, she's not an empiric, she, she, doesn't have, she doesn't have to test. She comes out of the womb and she runs and she knows her world. You know, she, she doesn't have to, to empirically investigate it. But, but she is one of hundreds of thousands of generations of goats whose perceptual apparatus has been formed in relation to a world through uh, an evolutionary process. And I think there's a lot to be said for a kind of an evolutionary Kantianism. Yeah? Why don't we all become goats? Yeah. Because we love to think, and we, and we love to take things apart. And once we've taken them apart, we want to put them together in new ways. So, so we, want to, we want to artificially create space, because it's fun to artificially create space. And we, I mean, we are world-creating animals. We, we don't like the world. The world is always not quite good enough. It's boring. It's, it's hard. So we want, to, we want to replace it with a better world. And we want to live in a better world. And if we can't live in a better world, at least we could live in a virtual better world. And if we know how, to, how we create worlds, we can artificially create a virtual better world. And then it'll be better. This is what we hope. And it's our tragedy, really, I think. What? What? Maybe we could become artificial uh, Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's, for me, that strikes a very serious note. Because I actually think. Um, with genetic engineering, it's increasingly possible to, to engineer, you know, we, till now we engineer these things, these the external things, physical things, but, but increasingly we can, we can engineer evolution. Uh, and it's just, that's, I think that's a bigger topic than we can, we can really think through adequately in the time that remains. I'm sorry? The, the special uh, role to, like, you know, the, to put ourselves in relation to the space around us. Yes. But in this imagination perspective. Are you, I'm sorry, are you asking a question or are you just? Yes. Okay, I didn't understand your question. I was uh, thinking that the 
delighted to chat about the evolution of our many generations and how we experience the world. Yeah. But as humans, we reconstruct everything. Yes, we do. So I was kind of joking, but actually seriously uh, asking if we could like experience the world in this artificial way of, as you said, becoming an animal or uh, perceiving different kinds of uh, physical traits and even uh, features that allow us to see the world in different ways and also to experience it physically, as you said. Yeah, so uh, there's a, a famous Canadian philosopher, um, and I'm a Canadian and I should remember his name right away, but. Uh, I can't remember his name, who talks about um, artificial media as an artificial sensorium. It's our artificial sensorium, how we view the world. And this theme of, could we artificially see the way another animal sees? That's what the telestereoscope can do for us. So for, for instance, an elephant has widely separated eyes. So maybe we could use this to see as an elephant sees. Yeah? As a bee. Interesting. Or what compound eyes? Because something that has compound eyes, that would be a crazy way to see, I think. Yeah? Or maybe infrared eyes. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Great, exciting questions. Um, yes? It's not really a question. I just want to know your opinion. Yes. Because all this talk about the animals and stuff had me thinking, isn't it funny how we humans can create the idea of space by simply like um, we go to a video game developer and we say we want to play we want you to make this game with binary code and he makes a game he creates spiritual space we can create space but we can explain the illusions that's that's funny to me because we have so much capacity to create and imagine yeah. and believing in our our lies that, uh, that our brain makes but then when we ask a simple question like, why this solution works, yes. I cannot explain it. And mm -hmm. I think it's funny. Okay. Uh, it's not a question, but I, I want to okay, yeah, I, I like that. And, and, uh, and I like the idea that we, we haven't answered every question. So, so I, I think maybe that might be a nice point to, to stop with that observation. Thank you for that observation. Thank you so much for coming. If you want to come down and, and play with the devices a little bit or talk a little bit further, you're certainly welcome to do that. But I uh, very much enjoyed being with you. <laughs>